Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the DLDM Podcast. This is Alan Linux speaking. Across from me is... Tyler Samples. This is a podcast where two DMs play in the same world, curate that world, and DM for each other. We talk about our experiences on both sides of the screen, and we're going to open up with a campaign recap. Bing! Um, I don't think we have anything new from my side since we last recorded, since we recorded right, right. after the Monday game. Right, right, right. Uh, needless to say, I, I'll... I'll say on that then is that i have big fat fun plans for the masquerade ball which is the next session that is coming up including but maybe not limited to a guest player or two i hope uh and uh, a fun one session only mechanics system oh yeah right that i'm actually largely borrowing uh from the tales from the loop rpg oh cool so if you haven't heard of that check that out it is by a Swede, uh, whose name I cannot recall. But Yorn. Sure. Anders. Is that right? I don't know. Okay. I was just guessing Swede name. Yeah. Um, sure. It, yeah. Christoph. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, Yalkinson. Um, and uh son of Yalkin. It is it's an it's a really cool system that is kind of dungeon worldly in that it, it puts a, a lot of emphasis on story um and actually does not have HP whatsoever. That's cool. Um it's it's a system wherein or or I should say that is meant to emulate the 1980s kid mystery genre of stuff. So like Stranger Things, the Goonies, um oh, that's sort of like, like boxcar children, <laughs> which is more like well, the 60s sort of. and 50s. More like, more like, like, uh, loose, um, fantastical or like magical mm-hmm. realism style. Sure, sure. Uh, Kid, Monster kid Squad. Detective, Gremlins, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, exactly, Monster Squad. So you play as a group of kids and you, the, the way they roll stats and like roll for successes and stuff is really fun and interesting and how they get around uh, needing hit points or like uh, dealing with like physical danger is super interesting. So I heavily yeah, recommend I, checking that out. I suppose because you're playing kids and it's not necessarily fun to play a kid getting killed. Yeah, actually in the rules it specifically states that the kids cannot die. That's um, great. They can... They basically can uh, become, I mean, <laughs> maybe worse, they can become broken mentally to the point where they don't want to go on, it, like, fun adventures anymore. Sure. Uh, or they can also they known literally, as puberty. Yeah, right. Or, or they age out is literally oh, when cool. your character hits 16 years old, they don't got time for that no more. Yeah. Um, I, and, can't, I can't be looking at monsters. I got to go look at goyles. <laughs> Go- and then the camera, like, like quickly zooms mm-hmm. in and out on their Jump face. Cut yeah. Or uh, cross cut. No. What is that? Uh, rack like a rack focus. focus. Rack yeah, focus. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's what I got planned. I'm, I'm basically borrowing heavily from that system because I want to emulate that sort of like mystery tone and yeah. uh, also make it less like, um, I'm going to say video gamey, but what I really mean is uh, combat focus. Because I think sure. right right now, the the way the stats look and feel on a D&D character sheet, it's all focused around combat, combat mechanics or keeping like the keeping your character alive mechanics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm trying to push away from that for this one session. And the hope is that no one will have to use their actual character sheets at all. Wow. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And if people even like doing that, which is just who knows, because I don't get to like play test it. Yeah. Will we get to use magic and stuff? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. So we'll need our sheets to track that. Presumably. Right. Yeah. Well, there be because that's the one thing I will say. The uh, uh, player to DM, I don't enjoy when our magic gets fudge because oh. then it becomes. Has I, have I done that? No, I don't oh. think so. That's why I'm saying it now. Because if if it happened and I'd said it, then it would be me chastising you, which would be. I thought you were awful. using this as a platform to talk about a thing I did one time. No, no, no. Which I'm I happy just, to do. No, it's more of like magic when it. Uh, uh, like I've played in games where it's like uh, where like you ignore ritual and sort of be like whatever you can just do detect magic all the time and it's like cool uh, well detect magic is a level one spell so you should be casting it because like otherwise if we're not like everything's built around like the warlock can only do so much at a time and that actually makes it interesting to play if you can't do infinite spells all the time you know yeah and things like that um, so for me I get a little when it, when it's like um, open ended and it's it's just like we can just do magic then it's like cool then why why did we make the choices we made for these characters if we can just do any 
anything that sounds cool, then it's like, cool. Then I'm not, uh, then there are no trade-offs. Oh, I see what you mean. And yeah, then, no. And then it's like, even beyond like, there's the trade-offs of like, uh, you know, well, they might notice that you're doing magic and that stuff. But even beyond that of just like the resource of self of like, you can only do so much magic. So you have to decide when you want to do it and when you don't yeah well i think and uh, this is just we found this naturally it had nothing this has nothing to do with what we had on the docket for this episode no. but uh i will say i think that that's something that's often overlooked in the uh intentional design of 5e yeah um which by the way uh we just tweeted out about this but there was an excellent 5e roundtable discussion about the system and about uh how D has evolved um and uh and when we say just tweeted out we actually we mean like three weeks ago we tweeted out but you should check right out. in real time as we record this we just tweeted it yeah but uh in actuality but it in was your time listeners weeks we ago yeah. on october 10th yeah um and uh i went ahead and revived i guess my feud with matt colville somehow in well this... now it more seems like you insulted one of his friends and so he's like running to his defense so it seems like you've expanded your feud well, he, it, really what it is is he's pouring fuel on the fire of me accidentally slighting someone else. Yeah. Which, as far as I'm concerned, that means the feud is back. Yeah, he's he's stirring, he's kicking the hornet's nest. So for those of you who have been listening episode to episode just waiting for me to bring back uh, my, um, you know, rivalry with... Or more Matt importantly, Cordo. waiting for me to bring back your yeah, rivalry. Yeah, right, because you, that's your domain. Yeah, he's well. trying to get under your skin, Alan. Yeah, I, it, it's really chapping my ass. Yeah, he, f- shots fired, shots against the bow. I guess. What are you going to do about it, man? What I'm going to do is talk about this. How 5e, I think, uh, it, well, in general, resource management, I think, uh, is often looked at through the lens of like um, balance, like mm-hmm. game balance and design choices that are meant to preserve a, a sense of power equilibrium. Um across classes right so Mm -hmm. you're like well why do wizards and clerics have like why do they have to prepare spells or why do they have why do we have to manage um you know long rests for recovering spell slots and why do we only why do we cap at four first level spells things like that um and those questions are often answered in terms of like well can you imagine how busted it would be or how broken or overpowered or whatever it would be to be able to just like cast detect magic or like cast shield all day and not have any repercussions um and i think that is one big side of it but i think the more important honestly the more important side of it is what you're talking about which is that without without turning it into a resource it it makes the decision to use your abilities and your spells um a lot less impactful Mm -hmm. so you don't have you, you wouldn't have situations where you know you're a fighter and you're fighting this troll or whatever and you're like do I burn my action surge? Like is is a huge question, right? Like it's action mm-hmm. surge widely regarded and rightfully so I think as one of the most powerful abilities of the game um, because it allows you to effectively cheat the action economy system. Right. So that question like do I burn my a- action surge now it would always be yes, right? Unless you only have one. Uh, and right. then the the answer is I don't know. The answer is always I don't know because you don't know as on the player side you don't know if you're going to fight something worse. Right. You don't know if you're going to need it later on in the fight to like help stabilize someone who's on the verge of death maybe or uh, if you like need to use a magic item and like that's going to cost like an extra action out of you or something like that. Um, the same with spells, right? If you you cast you burn your third level spell slot and you're uh, level five mm-hmm. and that's your only one and then shit like turn out you really needed that yeah. um well it, it 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 puts a lot more uh it puts a lot more of the the narrative into the player's hands by when they choose and what they choose right to use yeah and like the other part of it also is um you get dm like i guess what i would call dm creep where like for example uh and again the, this is just using something um that first came to mind it's not really the best example it's just like what popped into my head is is like um so historically like in our game i will usually be saving a spell slot to heal somebody mm-hmm. um because i'm one of the three people that can do that and so and one of the one people who will do that well and so that's the thing is so i've gone <laughs> down a few times because i haven't used a spell slot because i was waiting to save somebody else and then other people will not make any effort to save me. And so now I've actually realized like there's no reason for me to save it because it's actually because you'll save them because like they don't know, like they don't quote unquote like know a- a- enough to like, um, like care about balance of like how much the game is affected by having a player be out. 
Um, so, so they'll just be like, oh, that's a bummer. Uh, like, or if they're out, they'll just sort of be like, well, I guess I'm dead. When it's like, we've talked a lot of like, no, you're not dead. You're unconscious. You're like barely out of it. But unless somebody does something, you're out of it. Uh, and so I have actually changed my gameplay style and I've adopted very much more of a like, Alan will, Alan will save you. Uh, because like I'm not going to, uh, and Alan will save you because I, I because you don't manage your resources, you don't value managing your resources. So it becomes the thing of like since it's not fun to you to manage your resources, and Alan wants to make a fun game, Alan will fudge like. A, a dice roll to make sure that you don't, you know, ha- have not have fun. So then I'm like, cool. Well, it's DM creep. Alan, like, wow. Now that I know yeah. that you feel that way, so now it's like I don't need healing word. I have like that's that's Alan's job. You have a healing uh, DM. I have healing DM. Uh, to be honest, I I don't think I've ever fudged. I might have like turned a monster's attention away, right? Um, but I don't think I've ever like let somebody cheat their death rolls or anything. No, but um, it, I'm saying more. It's like they wouldn't ever get to death rolls oh like the only yeah i don't know maybe i'm incorrect that's why i said i don't think it's the best example because i the more i think about it i'm like i actually don't know that that actually has ever happened but it is a thing where i've uh, i do i realized that i don't save that last spell slot anymore in part because like after the third time of like going down and nobody making any effort to like do anything to to like pull me up i was like cool that's just like not how we're playing and also like fuck you guys <laughs> like no less is way more less is learning more about the world and being like cool all right i'm gonna i'm gonna cast that shield and i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna like stay my up and, and like do my own thing yeah um which in <laughs> which is what was funny uh but it has rubbed off a little bit in the last time i played al uh somebody went down and i was purposely not participating in this fight at all because i was like oh because i'm a warlock and so i was like eldritch blasting and it was like i'm not gonna get into the fray like i'm weak and i have this bomb ass spell so i was just like hanging back and somebody went down and then the fight was over and uh so i was like i'm gonna walk over to them and just be like uh get down and whisper in their ear there are other people who can do this better than me and then i was like and then i just walk away so i was like there's two healers in the group like why would i do a medicine check right now well because they value their spell slot more than they value their buddy yeah and it had somebody done that then i would have been like fuck you dude all right fine now i'll come in yeah like now that you're making this warlock be the healer of the group i mean your warlock is the hero we all deserve yeah elan is a very special elan elan that's very close to my name it is i picked it because it's style in french and he's a shoe designer oh sweet i like yeah it. Um, um well that actually segues into something we did want to talk about this episode do you want to recap you wanted to keep going oh, oh i see no i mean and the thing we want to talk about was a recap well, just briefly <laughs> uh alan wasn't there for our, uh, the last uh western campaign session i wasn't um where i remember we left off was uh we were going to leave this guardian naga um, with the prism, this like all magic boosting artifact uh, of all times, mm-hmm. to go talk to Daisy, the Nothic, who used to in a previous life be Falls of Fibli, the um, Grand Castera of this like majocracy that has since fallen to ruin. Mm-hmm. And the reason we had to go talk to her is because the two of them seem very friendly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And also very forthright, but their information is the information they've given us is completely contradictory. Yeah. So now we've kind of hit a crossroads as a party where we need to like figure out what we believe from each of them and then kind of like pick a side. Yeah. Well, what and it's I'll like say... a weird, a weird on the fence thing we've never had to do before because usually we just kick the door down guns a blazing. Yeah. Um, what I'll say is you had to pick a side. Uh oh, we picked uh, a side. You've picked a side. Oh fuck. Um. Yeah. So so in yeah, short, I, I have no idea what happened. Yeah. And uh, like full disclosure, I'm using like a heavily heavily modded uh Dark Suns uh setting campaign that I found on the internet. Um, that like I, you know I don't think. I'm not like a huge supporter of like pirating material. I just didn't have any other way to, to I saw a map and I so I'm using the map from uh and the concept of a sunken city from that. So like support your support Wizards of the Coast, but also like this is pre Wizards of the Coast. There's nothing to support here. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I buy my books. If you find it, it's yours. Yeah, I buy my books though. 
for sure. Oh, me too. Um, but I do also have PDF versions of them. I do too. And you know what? For that, I blame Wizards of the Coast because if they just gave a free PDF along with book purchases, then I would do that. We or, should talk about D&D Beyond sometime because it, it yeah. looked like it was going to be so great. And then when the the actual subscription model rolled out, it could not have been a worse like yeah, just tier boring. system of subscription. Yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, shoot. I just remembered something about Magic I wanted to say, but Ooh. I'll save it. I was just going to say, there. I like the systems that don't use Vancian magic. Um, Vancian? Vancian magic is like the spell slots. You have a certain spell oh, slot gotcha. per day. Uh, it's based on uh, uh, a fantasy author that that's sort of how he modeled his magic systems in his books. Um, I think his name is Jack Vance, but I might just be coming up with a cool name. Jack Vance is a great name. Um, there is other systems where it's like the more spells you cast, the increasing chance of something going horribly wrong. That's fun too. Because you're like uh, tempting, like tempting, you're messing with the natural boundaries of, of magic and law, which I think is cool. It was super fun, but neither here nor there. Anyway, um, so they're trying to get into this uh, sunken city that is cubed off. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of like exposition trying to be like masqueraded as interesting um, plot points and and like things uh, just because I've been tr- trying to do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of like making an interesting space, uh, which is the reason why I always like to use a found map because it just does some of the work for me so that every room isn't just like there's a door and four walls and a lamp in the corner like oh sweet a lamp yeah i rub the lamp uh and it's uh it turns on it's like a, a f- oh it's floor. like the clapper but you yeah. have to rub it yeah it's a touch lamp that's cool yeah i pocket the lamp um yeah it collapses nice yeah oh i turn it i turn it off first i rub i Ooh, rub it off you take fire damage because you forgot to turn I it off forget. before i you... didn't specifically stay. um and like that's super fun but i enjoy having stuff a little bit more where it's like oh this is a city that is like been rattled by earthquake and is like sinking into a swamp and that affects stuff very cool um so that was a long-winded way to say anyway here's the recap of what's been going down in the western campaign they made their way back out of the sunken city this cubed off um vacuum sealed portion of the city uh, in which lies the prism of cassidy the the object that daisy the nothic sent them to go get when they met the guardian uh, so they they left to go meet with daisy they uh had an encounter with some willow wisps uh little moats that we call them um, that are oh. parts of the collar um, manifested on the ethereal plane. Mm-hmm. It also is really helpful having Matt Myers as a player because his character is a planeswalker, uh, like Ranger. Um, so he knows uh, he's like a great exposition dump because it's very easy to be like, you would know this because your character is focused on this stuff. So here's some stuff, just a shorthand. Um so they uh, did that because I'm trying to institute closer to a six to eight encounter a day uh, uh, combat schedule or like encounter schedule. Uh, and long story short, they met Daisy. Daisy uh, put a geese on Jeff's character, Kamal, using... Oh, geese? Yeah. Geese? 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 G-E-A-S. Yeah. And Gius. Uh, Gius. Yeah. Sure. And uh commanded using the medallions, which it turns out are uh laced with the the ability for the Grand Castera to control whoever wears one. Wow. Uh and it demanded that he go get the prism and bring it back to her. So people got a little squirrely about her because that made them feel fairly uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't kill her immediately. Well, she was using her environment. She was up in the audience stands of the uh, the uh, place where Ah, and they didn't have their spider climbing tank. Yeah, what is the word for that? What the arena? Arena? Uh, She was up in the stands of the arena. It was just too far. They she just like ran away before they could do anything. Um, So she's bad. Well, and then they had further conversation with her, um, and she made the argument of she's just she wants it to become a lich uh in order to finish her lich process because she's halfway through um that's what a nothic is in this setting um and she wants it just so that she can defeat vakix the big bad um and she's willing to make sacrifices along the way including of herself but she's so, so that's her argument is I need this to become this thing. She's also having, she has some memory problems because the lich process has stripped away a lot of herself. So Mm -hmm. she doesn't remember all of her motivations all the time. 
Anywho, they went back in. Uh, the long and short of it was they went back in. Um, oh, Sheriff Boots came back as a revenant um, and is um, sort of like pooling around next to them in this like Icarus ooze of um, like morphed. A revenant. What's her? Uh... His. Yeah. Sorry. What's, what's his goal? Um, uh, d- publicly TBA. Whoa. Okay. Um, but I, I think in reality, I think. I think we left it open, but I think it's basically kill the frog hemoth. <laughs> kill the frog hemoth that killed his girlfriend. Uh, no, he was sent back by his patron. Uh, he was so it's his patron has a goal that he has to achieve. Um, t- just to make things interesting, he also realized that Rake. Uh, oh, he all he also experienced the collar firsthand as a result of dying. Uh, and was pl- pressed into what I was like. I think I did a pretty good job of describing like a psychic hell of being like crammed into a phone booth with 50 other people to the point that you can't tell what's yourself and what's somebody else anymore but all it is is screaming Jesus. So it's just being surrounded by screams and you don't know which ones are yours and which ones are other people's. And you experience that for a thousand years. Yikes. He realized that that is likely where Rake went since the collar is the souls of any dead magic users. So he's pretty on board with the like, we got to break this. We got to kill the collar. Uh, but the collar is tied to the prism. So if the prism, if they bring, if they destroy the collar or they move the prism, then the prism will be up for grabs and the big bad can come in and try to get it. There's just a lot of angles on this one and then ultimately they uh had jeff as kamal talk to the guardian he challenged her to a foot race um she was just having a good time having somebody to talk to and other people snuck in and they pulled the prism from the wall and the guardian immediately disintegrated because she had failed her her job and the cube started to collapse and so you guys are in a sunken city that is imploding uh like 40 feet under Underneath a swamp. Wow. Um, yeah, and that's where we left off. Wow. Yeah. Do we get our hands on the deck? Not not known yet. You have to give it. You you guys agreed to give the prism to Daisy in order to get the deck. Okay. Well. Also, I did get to elaborate a little bit on the deck of many things. That the myth behind the deck of many things in, in uh, the mutant colony community is that on the day that the gods were banished for whatever reason, uh, each one had a strip of flesh torn from their body, and each strip became a card of the deck of many things. Damn. So each card is like the power of a god condensed into one single card that is a pretty awesome description of the deck of many things i I was pretty stoked about it yeah yeah so anyway that was way too long of a summary no i mean that's all news to me i mean maybe maybe it was too long i don't know from my perspective not at all yeah it's what i will say from a a dming standpoint in terms of like being useful for a podcast it's been interesting the last couple weeks have been interesting for a few reasons one i've been cracking down on myself in terms of like resource management in terms of being like you can take a short rest now you won't be able to take a long rest because you'll get harassed by these will-o'-wisps and stuff and so it is interesting watching it be where they're like well we can't actually get back because we i'm out of spells so i can't fly uh and like having conversations like that is gratifying to hear because it means people are actually sort of um being like oh shit we're this is difficult it's also been it was interesting trying to get people back into the right mindset uh, coming into like mid-session and being like so just remember like you took a short rest but like or you're taking a short rest but this is like a horror movie like you guys have been for days just running and running and this is like taking a break while jason is still looking for you this is not like a good break this is not like a relaxing rest this is like like it's like absolute necessity yeah yeah um and that was fun to like play that up um and then yeah also just like trying like having an idea like having a lot of stuff that is like starting to enter this the stage of because you guys are like roughly level eight so stuff starts to become like more mythically powered around now like around level 10 is when it really um and it it's just funny because it just like what it means practically is things require a ton more exposition because you have to like make stuff that's like world moving because it's like i can't like us you guys aren't gonna fight a bear it has to be like i mean i'll fight a bear you'll fight a bear for sure but it has to like but the bear can't be like the bear isn't life or death anymore so it has to be like the bear is an avatar for something or yeah it's weird how that goes yeah 
which is the one thing like I've seen that there are systems in place uh, or other systems where they limit it so that you only ever go up to like level six. And I actually think that that's very fun because I think I for me, I always I think fighting a bear is always more entertaining to me than fighting uh, like an ancient dragon. Right. Because it's like more conceivable and more just like. Yeah. I think it's fun sometimes to just, I guess, to consider the flip side of that coin. I do think it's fun to see your characters, like, become basically demigods. Uh, yeah. And, and then to, to as a reminder for DMs out there, the only way to make your characters remember or notice how far they've come is to throw something like that at them, where they're like, uh, for example, something that they distinctly remember almost dying to when they were level three. Um, if it comes back, you know, the ogre comes back or the et- or whatever comes mm-hmm. back at level at level nine and they're like wow that was easy like we just beat the shit out of that thing right. um or like you know you sick like 30 knolls on them or something and they're like cool i cast fireball and the war, the barbarian makes like three attacks and then they're dead they're just all dead um because that those are the moments that like those are benchmarks because otherwise the the game is designed to like replace replace the relative danger of a bear at level two with something equivalent for a like level right. nine party or whatever is the goal of the cr system um but that doesn't mean that's how you have to design encounters no um and on the flip side of that if you want uh if you want to design your encounters to be like scary or deadly or dangerous um that's that's the part that gets hard as the characters start to level because it's really hard to to differentiate like you know yeah you're fighting um you know uh i'll just use the same example so you're fighting like an etten or like a Mm -hmm. troll or or cyclops some kind of like roughly level level five level six party uh a large large dumb strong thing yeah so you're fighting that um and then if i'm like cool uh here comes a like a cloud giant or like a fire giant yeah the party at the table especially with my table who are fairly fairly uh to very new Mm -hmm. uh, many of them first time players as far as like my game goes um Asking them to, or like trying to explain visually without metagame knowledge, the difference in power level between those two things is almost impossible, right? Uh Because I'm like, no, you don't understand. It looks huge and strong. Um, And they're like, yeah, but we literally ate an ogre, like as a joke, we memed it, we memed it to death our last right. session um so we feel strong so it's hard it gets hard to communicate as you move into like abstract monsters i think it does get hard to communicate sometimes like a sense of mortality or a sense of danger right um but uh to counterbalance that it does get easy uh to demonstrate that the party is getting stronger and i think that's a key part in like feeling like a hero is uh going back to you know monsters or situations similar to things that were struggles before and like showing that they're easy you know what i mean right like luke skywalker he can't um he can't he can't deflect the blasters like from that little thing with that yeah with the blast shield down and in, in a new hope but then at the end of it um he can he's the only person in the galaxy who can shoot a like a, a tennis ball sized uh torpedo into a fucking hole uh in the side a hole the size of like a cup holder in a literal moon right it's like the size of a fucking planet um so you you getting to see that growth or like getting to getting to feel tangibly um your power go up avoids that syndrome that i think honestly plagues a lot of video games yeah um which is that as you get stronger your enemies rise to meet you and then the game sort of feels the same all the time right um but as a dm you get to you get to tweak that and like go you, back and forth. The goal, the goal being, you know, that you, you sh- it shouldn't always be about like uh, satisfying the demands of a challenging fight, but creating the feel at the table that you want to feel. Yeah. And uh, I, yeah, like, you I can agree. make a bear. So I can make like a uh, fuck, fuck the, the book. I can make a bear that's like horrifyingly powerful and they whack at it all day and nothing happens and it eats them and it fucking just rips people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're level 10 yeah. and they're like, I don't understand i used high the- bite on it like why isn't it and i'm like fuck you it's a big ass angry bear like yeah. that's just the way it is um 
But uh, I can also be like, you know, this like huge snake and the thing, whatever. And, the, and you know, uh, Ian's like, uh, I punch it and I use Flurry of Blows. And I'm like, great, it explodes into like yeah. little meat blobs. Right. Because you guys are you guys are scary now. Like you're big, strong, scary yeah. dudes. Although I, so I, one thing that I, well, two I things. rambled on that for way too long. That's so. totally fine. Um, one thing I enjoyed uh, talking about the session afterwards was uh, I was like, yeah, because with the Naga, I was like, I, I'm I, so it was towards the end of the session. I made a few decisions on the fly, like changing the context of stuff. I was like, this Naga has been nothing but polite to everybody and like very forthright and has just been stating like her truths. Um, and I was like, I don't think it will be fun to have to fight this at all because it will just feel like this sucks also because like nagas are super powerful so it's not like an easy fight yeah and it will just be like this feels shitty and weird this feels like we're just abusing uh like somebody who's a security guard and like a nice one like a doorman basically who's yeah. just like you i can't let you take that stuff and you're in your and like and you're like ah, uh, i'm really sorry but like secretly i'm a fucking like genie and i can yeah literally obliterate you with the snap of my fingers right he is yeah, yeah. the security guard is right um and so i was just like cool i'm not even gonna bother having it it's just once the prism gets touched she's she's gone uh just because like her job is to protect it her, her job has failed uh and I, so i said that to matt and jeff and they were like oh yeah we knew we were never gonna fight it we knew like something that big being that nice means like it could destroy us interesting which i was like that's a really fun thing to realize that, like the the power of being of being a confident character that's like not intimidated by these big strong people is like a pretty useful way to be like you might not want to like engage this person um yeah like not afraid of or angry at you at all yeah and similarly and related the other th- thing uh that i think is useful to to deal with with like i'm trying to explain the presence the power of a cloud giant is is like you have um say like an etten that we're fighting that you know so you you have like as we're going to the the encounter you have uh and we i've talked about this before of like my favorite thing is like having like multiple uh uh opposite like uh, opposing goals that don't directly interact with each other so it's like as you're walking and you see the cloud giant you get attacked by an etten and you're fighting it and as the cloud giant gets closer the etten is like basically you you just have the classic thing of like the etten goes and swipes at the cloud giant and then the cloud giant like just flicks it like a mile away and then that's like a pretty useful way for everybody to be like whoa whoa shit yeah we're not gonna fuck with that which is something that i'm excited to try in the next session depending how things go interesting i have i'm build trying to build up to the next stage of basically to to make everybody realize like oh fuck we are we are becoming mythic and we need to like start being able to like handle ourselves um yeah that's all i have to say yeah yeah um but in oh yeah so in general it was uh the other t- shoot there was something else i wanted to talk about in terms of what i learned from from that session specifically from that session i think it was just like the value of like rich language yeah really does does the job well it's been interesting talking about like uh just like flipping the kinds of characters that the players interact with because this the danon arc um in the eastern campaign has been sort of similar where like I, I guess it didn't really occur to me that like with few exceptions, most of the people that uh, the party ha- that your party has been interacting with have been like um, either dummies or like kind of like grumpy. Yeah. Um, and dum- mostly because dummies, dummies are my favorite kind of people to play. Uh, and <laughs> and then secondarily, because trying to play like an ordinary person going about their business um, quickly leads me to grumpiness when like, yeah, <laughs> interacting with your your group in particular. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because we don't have we're like, I'm not even gonna say we're because they are sociopaths. They're, they're like, Le- yeah, I, Les is trying real hard to like, maintain a sense of like social contract yeah they Uh, don't care about that no um but that that so that's that was a real flip for me was like you know there's like a palpable sense of like creepiness about the danons just because they've been like kind to you guys so far um and like without questions 
Well, and that uh, is actually like another example of DM creep that I think is interesting is the idea of because like I had the same we've talked about this before. I was also like making every character grumpy or or every character slightly oppositional because people would always be like because the characters were always oppositional. Mm -hmm. And so I would so I realized like at some point like, oh, I'm I'm enabling this and like being like, yeah, this is the right way to be. And so like with Daisy and the Naga were two examples where I was like, I really want to like reset people's uh, like expectations expectations for interacting with strangers to be like there are people whose feelings can get hurt by you who won't hurt you they'll just be like they'll just be hurt yeah they'll be hurt they won't be mad because they're they'll just be like that was really mean what you said uh and like make people have to be like oh wait why did i say that and like realize that they're playing people um which i think has been very entertaining especially because what i've uh, and sorry to hijack no the other thing that i've been doing uh, and this is because we're actors and and I'm a director and everything is that like uh, I have been teasing out character motivations from people was something I did this last session where it was like Jeff said something to Sheriff and I was like now the way you said it makes it sound like you don't you're not like you don't respect her as much anymore or respect him as much anymore is that true and he's like oh yeah I like I am I no longer look up to him and and like getting them to say that uh, out of character made it really fun to then play that because then Chelsea like dived in to this like oh shit like i have like you're taken for granted that yeah, yeah. I've, i'm a bull like i'm this bully dude and we just talked a lot about like how our characters were feeling relative to each other and it made for this really entertaining thing where it's like two guys who are trying to make sheriff be their or who think sheriff is their best friend and sheriff hates both of them or like sheriff dislikes both of them but now the two guys are like well then fuck you like we don't need you you suck and then sheriff starts to be like oh no 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 come no. back Come back. Yeah, the, my whole my yeah. whole character is predicated on being validated by yeah. everyone all the time. It's very fun. Anyway, so um, oh I, well, I was just gonna say I I think I accidentally did the opposite thing where everyone was like, "There's something wrong with these Danans because yeah. they're so nice," and I was like all right fuck it yeah there is yeah. something like whatever i'll like play right into player expectations yeah so i might now i'm concerned that i'm like <laughs> accidentally confirming that like beware of anyone who is not like mean mean or stupid or like easily manipulable manipu- right. manipulatable easily manipulated i yeah. guess is what i'm trying to say um yeah but i i don't i don't know i the the way the dan and arc has been progressing progressing so far has been like super fun for me on my side of the screen so i don't uh i don't feel bad about it at all no like, I and mean, I, you shouldn't but it is like a, a worthwhile thing as a dm to always be considering like how um how imperturbable am i making these characters right through the world that i'm presenting them with because then it becomes increasingly hard for them to give a shit about stuff if if they always win and the key to it is not to make them lose but is to is like to, to show them that like the winning that they're doing is ultimately hollow compared to other things that they could be doing right or, so, the, or the way that they win um can like cheapen or have impacts on like the value of winning too yeah yeah exactly so it's like affect the rest of the world from their actions uh like we uh in your game we encountered like uh a woman who got kidnapped and we encountered her husband and we like made fun of her, her husband for like caring that she was missing and implied that he was the reason for it but i liked that you had her be like i love my husband and i'm like glad to come back because it like made it so that it wasn't a thing where it was like yeah we were right to make fun of that grieving husband yeah but instead everyone was like they were like oh well i guess you are both lame and i was like oh well fuck it i guess we are both lame. <laughs> nah i didn't think we were both. i thought i was like that's fun I liked it. But I think I do think it's important. Like, you know, it's something I, I hadn't really thought about. And there, there's there's just a million things to always be thinking about when you're running the game. Yeah. Because um, you're a novelist with one fifth of the control. Right. And it, it, I think it's uh, it's worth considering, like, look, taking a look at, you know, your past five sessions or 10 sessions or however fa- far back you have notes or can remember um, and just asking yourself as a DM like am I falling into patterns of interaction um, am I like am I uh, accidentally guiding or um, like incentivizing interacting with the world or the NPCs in a certain way you know what I mean if all my mm-hmm. characters sound the same or they all have they're all um, affected by the same like tactics of social interaction 
person. Right. Um, or they are all dumb or they're all like snooty or they're all easily you know, like, seduced. All easily seduced. What is that? What is that? Um, you know, what, what am I, what am I telling my players inadvertently? Mm -hmm. Like, what am I subtextually telling my players about how to play the game? Right. Um, because, you know, if, if something works every time and other things don't or are met with resistance, then y you are inadvertently, just by nature of the way you interact with the players, you are inadvertently, um, setting rules. You're setting like mm -hmm. contextual or sometimes subtextual rules for how you expect or want them to interact with you. Yeah. Uh, so it's worth sitting down. I'm like, yeah. And, and yeah, the same thing for you and me then of being like, well, damn, all my NPCs are like ornery or like easily offended. Mm -hmm. Um, or like hapless. That's when you do my trick and you develop a uh, adventure where there are no NPCs. Yeah, because you're smart all, move. Like the beauty, the one beauty and the no one, NPCs, the no one economy. Thing I understand, yeah, the one thing I understand about dungeon delves and like dungeon crawling is, as a DM, it's way easier because you don't have to make up all of these people with like complex personalities because you're just like things that want to kill. It's so simple as a DM to run it. Yeah, then it's like a video game for you as the DM. The harder part is when you as a DM, like I said, when you have to be like oh i'm writing a story but i but like uh exquisite corpse style where i just put a little bit out there and then i get a whole bunch back from the players and i have to like figure out what happens next mm -hmm. but if you haven't tried dming that way it's super fun it is you, super fun if you get the right group for it it's actually funny to hear you bring up the uh dungeon delve thing because uh in uh, in my second of two so far oh, yeah. AL games, um, the DM was uh, we had like a goblin encounter, and I was like, uh, he was like, they're yelling, you know, they're chattering and like screaming at you, and I'm like, oh, what are they saying? And he's like, they're just they're just yelling a goblin. Um, and I was like, cool, I talked to them, and he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I I'm a hobgoblin, I speak goblin, like that's yeah. I'm just I'm gonna talk to them and try to end this combat. And there was like a long pause. Yeah, uh, and he was like, oh okay and like it it was clearly like not on the docket yeah um which is it just made me laugh thinking about that in the context of like yeah isolating isolating the characters and i think that's why the dungeon model yeah. is uh so popular and like um is now like a trope um is because it's an easy way to kind of like take the characters out of social context and like bloop bop them into right. a little bubble where you can be like aha now i can run i have like the mental space to yeah. run traps it's, and like fights like and really war games like the real like old school war game style yeah um so it's it's an interesting like uh look at the dungeon delve as like a strategy rather than yeah yeah that i mean and, and speaking of the word games i always just think it's funny to like think of that D, D started as like where it was like playing like we're recreating world war ii with little minis and, and a battle mat and everything and then being like we'll do it with fantasy so instead of artillery we'll use magic users to represent like like the blaster blast yeah. blasting and stuff and so and then under that model you're like well yeah of course you're not going to like go have diplomacy with the tank section like they're <laughs> tanks so you're just going to fight the tanks but like they didn't think about the follow-through of like oh right but instead of being the artillery i'm actually just one person so i actually get to have like my own motivations like thoughts and feelings and thoughts and feelings and i can be like and the other artillery is just some other person so i can just go over to her and be like hey do you want to like talk for a second before we keep blasting each other is like such a funny accidental thing that that these essentially like this essentially like not like non interpersonal mm -hmm. game like accidentally became a very personal like a very interpersonal game because they just brought the scale way down it's still it's like still evolving too. like yeah a lot of that terminology like like blaster controller um you know tank uh healer like all, all these like terms that survived through like multiple editions of D D um have either fallen away or sort of become like classes yeah uh, like class identities um so so you're kind of seeing like uh, a, a continuous move away from that like um sort of like uh you're playing a thing Mm -hmm. mentality and evolving towards like uh you're playing a like a like a person yeah um and that i think that character creation goes a lot into that too like you're seeing all these like um all these like sub race options and like right you can customize by like taking feats and like all this other stuff and it, it's you know 
if you're if you're the wizard now, you don't you don't have to like and in uh, in a lot of ways the classes are kind of like in concentric kind of Venn diagram circles yeah. now where you know if I want to heal, I'm like great, I can be a druid or like a cleric or a bard, um, or I can like I can kind of play the healer role mm -hmm. by hitting the paladin side or like hitting the I can play like an abjuration wizard and just mm -hmm. try to keep people healthy that way, or I can play like a like a battlefield control like fog cloud uh blindness like wizard and try yeah. to keep people safe that way um so like rather you're seeing a rather than like i am an artillery piece i fire big guns you know right um you you can see that kind of move around with uh, all, the, all the classes where you're like yeah you can design the class to fit the the kind of way you want to play yeah which is the other reason why I love lower level stuff so much. Uh, and like, I'm super biased against or for lower level play because that's really all I've ever had a chance to do because games play out of, like games always end before level 10 mm -hmm. for me. Like I've never been a level 10 character. Um, so who knows? Like maybe it's fucking rad. It probably is. I mean, people seem to enjoy it, but it's probably cool. It's I, I imagine. And with limited experience DMing higher level parties, it, it does get really hard to like challenge a party with that many resources yeah but what i do love most is at early levels especially early early level like level one play i love when you can be you are your background first and your class second because mm -hmm. like for al i really am enjoying being a shoemaker who got forced into a warlock uh, pack <laughs> and is like a warlock for sure but i where i'm like always like looking at people's shoes trying to figure out like what materials i can get to make shoes getting into a lot of debates where i'm like well i want to take that dinosaur skin so i can make dinosaur boots and then the the dm being like oh you won't be able to make boots out of it and i'm like i'm a shoemaker i'll make boots out of it yeah don't worry don't, I, don't, and, don't... and being like also to be clear i don't want to do anything with those boots i just want to yeah i'm a shoemaker i'm not asking for mechanical yeah. benefits I just want, which is, I think, more of an, L an AL thing than yeah. like a, um, than like a right. rules as written thing, right? Um, because <laughs> you know your character exists in in a lot of ways in AL. Your character exists to progress, right? Like, uh, it's it's a loot system, right? So like you you obtain the loot and the XPs and the gold so that you can better obtain loot and yeah, XP, XP and gold. gold. Um, yeah, it's the same as like you know your uh any any dungeon or like roguelike mm -hmm. yeah. game or uh loot based systems like like Destiny is yeah. one that I actually stopped because I stopped playing because I didn't just, I just didn't like that kind of grind. Yeah. Um but um yeah it's it's funny to to think about that like sort of uh the the person versus the uh I guess the the ex the mechanical expectations yeah of character and at like higher levels like we started at level three mm -hmm. and and as characters have died and like moving on you know starting at like level five or whatever then I think it's like I enjoy doing a similar thing where I'm like cool I like the idea of treating the classes like my background of like I'm not just a fighter like I'm trained to fight like why or how or which then gets into like weird stuff because it's like sometimes I'm like well I want to be a warlock because that seems fun but i don't want to like or like i want to be a fighter because it fits some parts of it but i don't want to focus on training so i'll just be inadvertently really good at fighting while mainly being an ale maker right because i want to be like i want to play a ale maker but we're fifth level so i'll be a fifth level ale maker um which does make me miss in third edition uh like the npcs had classes that you could level up in which was always just so entertaining because you could be like uh like a level five commoner Amazing. Yeah. Which you kind of still can do if you... Uh... It was great. If you just like use the leveling rules, but apply them to the monster manual stats. Yeah, which is exactly. You can just like upgrade their HP yeah. accordingly. Because they all, like everything in the monster manual has hit dice, mm -hmm. like a hit die uh, associated with it. Yeah. It's really, I for some reason, I find it very confusing because they don't have, I feel like they don't have like a really clear system of like, here's how many hit die you should give if you want. Like, Yeah, you have to like do the math yourself. So mathy. Yeah. Um, Alan, before we go. Oh, me... God. Oh, Okay. I just wanted I thought to you were going to make me do the sign off thing, but that's definitely a you, so I don't It is definitely me. Yeah, I don't want to uh, do it. Uh no, I was just going to ask um since we're talking so much about characters and stuff right now, just like uh, and we might have touched on this before, but when you're making a character like what is your uh what's the first th the question you ask yourself when you're as a player making a new character or like what's the first thing you look towards? 
You know, uh, I mean, I feel like we could tease this for a future episode because I think we could spend some actual time really breaking it down. For um, sure. But the basics of it usually boil down to uh, if if I'm looking for a change or not, because uh, there's there's so much. Obviously, there in at this rate, five um, e the. Wizards has been phenomenal about releasing content in the form of UAs and in, in the yep. form of new source books. Um, X- you know, Xanathar is coming out. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm so ready for that. Same. Um, and uh, I think that uh, at this rate, there there's just characters like character combinations and like class race combinations coming out faster than I can kill my characters off to like, yeah. p- play them all. Um, so I, I, there's still ones that combos from the PHB that I haven't even hit yet. Yeah. Same. Um, that I've been curious about. So it's just, I think the starting question is like, you know, what do I want to do now is like what I always think about. Cause I always think of, uh, I, I tend to approach my character from functionality more than, um, like, a like a kind of backstory or, uh character driven point of view because i think i just sort of trust and this might might just be because of you know years of um of uh mental conditioning slash brainwashing from improv but um i i think i kind of trust myself to like find the character as i go if i have to yeah but i i i usually approach it in terms of questioning like what 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 do i see this character how do i see this character functioning is this like a like a deft like snipey smart talky Mm -hmm. person is this like a like a wizened old like um, you know, like arm wrestling person is this like a like a snappy like s- like magical thief character? You yeah. know what I mean? Like I try to put together um their their bio, I guess, or not bio, but their log line. Yeah, um, like before, their elevator pitch. Yeah, yeah. Before I put together their like uh origin story. Yeah. So it's it usually boils down to me like flipping through the through the books and being like. Damn, you know, I remember Triton looking really cool when I flipped through Volos. <laughs> <laughs> or I picked one at random. I, I don't yeah, actually right. remember what Triton does at all. Uh, um, just, it's like, like plus one to three stats. I, it looks fine mechanically. It just is like, what the, what the shit is this shit? I don't know what Why it do is. Why do we have... It's a mer- just it's a, a mermaid. mermaid that walks. Yeah, it's, just, it's a mermaid with feet. W- which is like super cool for the 1% of... Uh, things that are anything to do with water and the rest of the time hey man, it's that's like, on you man, i love water shit well, yeah right we haven't done anything with water you we guys had... didn't like my water stuff so i, I wasn't there doing that. it i wasn't there that oh, okay campaign. well i mean look i write, also, I write for the players the answer is i wouldn't have unless well the you wouldn't is, have liked the water i stuff? would have i love water stuff <laughs> um yeah wisconsin dells samples they call you it's weird it's weird because i've never been and i don't know what it is oh all i know is the commercials because the kids are always oh, covered i was in water. being i was joking i i have been and i do know what it is oh i grew up in the midwest well there you go um, anyway that's that's so yeah i just flipped through the book and i'm like damn triton or oh, excuse me i'm sorry i'll, I'll flip no. through the book and i'll be like oh dragonborn As- asimar oh. looks fun that's the one you like right you love that kind of shit i don't like asimar well, but i do am you playing like anything in al i like humans dude i know you like humans but nobody I, i've humans. never flipped through the book and been like they're wow a human what is the humans human? are, you know what it is for me uh and uh, flexibility no humans fit best with backgrounds because like it's like yeah of course like you get to be fully your background as a human like you don't have to be other things on top of it mm. you get to just be again and like i really like can i have a reason <laughs> yeah you can oh the candy mm-hmm. not not a no. reason for why i like it i just realized i was eating your candies when I was oh I, I didn't care that's why they're out um but thank you. I appreciate your politeness. Uh, I mean, I had that already a, started eating. Yeah, that's a great NPC interaction that we had. <laughs> uh, the um, yeah, when when you're playing a human, I I like an expanded background list. So like, I know there's like the twelve or thirteen that you have, but like within and they are meager. I will say that they are, except for like if you look at like guild artisans, it's it has a breakdown of like the different guild artisans, and I love having that be part of it. I love having like I want to, I always want to be a rat catcher mm-hmm. or like a gong farmer, which you know just like a poop a poop man, a poop cleaner upper, a poop man. Yeah, a gong farmer is a thing from the, the Middle Ages. I've just never or, heard it called a poop man before. Well, whatever, or a Fletcher <laughs> or an ale. You know, like I like uh, the the specificity of a of what your job is Mm -hmm. is so entertaining to me, especially as a human to be like, I'm that. But I end up being in full plate armor calling on the gods to smite a dragon 
uh, b- because like that's been my progress, like my progression as a story, um, and like getting to getting to like have that progression for, from being like like the thing is like with a dragonborn, it's like it's harder for me mentally to be like I'm a dragonborn rat catcher because it's like nah, you've already got like so much other stuff going on. You're a dragonborn. Yeah, you don't have to be a rat catcher. Yeah, you're just a dragonborn. Who and neither a to paladin. you, audience. You can be whatever you want to be. Wow, you stole it from me. No, no, I didn't. No, I wasn't going to do that one. That was a freebie from Alan. But yeah, that, no, I think that's a, a cool way to approach it too. So you kind of start, you start with like, you start with background when you're building nah, a person. When, when I'm building a character, my first question is what haven't I played before? Yeah. Um, I get most excited once I get around to the point of like, what's my background going to be? And then I'm like, oh, how does this work? Like, how did this person get from there to the adventure that we're having? Mm-hmm. Which is why for AL... Uh, You're a shoe guy. I, I'm shoe guy now, but I decided for... What's your name? Elon Payless? Elon, uh, no last name. No last name? Yeah. Elon... Payless, I think a- it's going to be. Elon DSW? I think it's Elon Payless is what it will be. <laughs> okay. um, and going forward, though, I because as we've talked about, it's fun to make characters. Uh, I've made like three characters that I will play in succession as each one dies, but they're all part... Uh, they're all uh, a Shoe group. Makers? No, they're urban bo- bounty hunters. <laughs> But they all work together. So as one dies, another one will come to try to find his friend. So I'll just play like, like, I love the idea now of like, oh, it's really fun to play like a group of friends one at a time who's like coming to find out what happened to their buddy and then gets pulled up into this adventure. Sounds like somebody really wants to play Tales from the Loop. It sounds great. I'm very. I I should run a Tales from the Loop game. You should. We should do an offline one shot. Okay, deal. Great. Um, Alan. Yo. I think we're about done. We got to. Uh, you're actually coming to my AL game. I am. for the first time tonight. How long is this episode? Right now, uh, we're at our. We're just over an hour. Ah, well, heads up, folks, because now you got a peek into our editing process. Whatever it is on your device, yeah, that's after an edit. Yeah, right. Surprise, surprise. It's after that, silence has been truncated, and there's been a lot of it. Yeah, um, and probably we'll cut that reason part. No, and this part. No. <laughs> Um, Alan, I'm gonna. So I'm just gonna end it with a, a phrase of the week. Great, and uh, with a promise that we will uh, we'll hit character creation a little more heavily in the yeah. future because I think uh, you know, as as James Amato pointed out a couple of episodes ago, uh, that's part of playing the game too. It is. Although and, I uh, had further thoughts about that too. Ooh, I encountered the phrase dollhousing. Dollhousing, which is what somebody else was was describing, which I realize is sort of the same thing as the like, but as like a negative term for it. Just in terms of like you set it all up. I was thinking about that and how he referenced. I think he said his friend Cat when she plays that she likes the personal play element, but then when they play with other people, she always feels like it's getting messed up. Yeah, her personal like a play sandcastle or, or like a dollhouse. Yeah, like the show Dollhouse. Um, I gotta, uh, I gotta tell you about, uh, where the, it got its name from. The show Dollhouse? Yeah. Or the, the, ter- the concept of dollhousing? Well, I gotta tell you about the concept of dollhouses <laughs> before I explain to you dollhousing. Okay. Okay. Um, but so that'll be on future episodes. Also on future episodes will hopefully be if you are following Alan's beef on Twitter. Oh boy. Um, you might then have time while you're doing that to, uh, pop a question test of like something you'd like us to talk about. Um, just, a uh, so it doesn't even need to be a question question you can just ask us for our hot takes and we will meander around giving them yeah just like uh, we do on the show yeah that's how we earned our name oh yeah heads up because we also have uh by the, by the time you hear this it'll probably be up already but we also yeah. have some fun new uh podcast art coming oh, yeah. up um that uh, actually looks like us so Yep, and leave a five star review on iTunes. That's right, and that's... yeah, we we don't advertise or make money off of this. We just do it for the love of the game, and uh, in the hopes that at very least someone who listens to this is entertained by listening to us ramble at each other, mm-hmm. and at most that uh, people glean maybe little sand sized nuggets of uh, gold that they can bring to their own tables and enrich their gameplay. It's funny because I have the opposite goals that at at least somebody leaves <laughs> informative with, first with informative stuff and at best i hope somebody was entertained by this i think uh mine just because that seems wildly less likely oh uh, see i feel the opposite because i i have way less confidence in my like ability to tell someone something they haven't heard before or can't find better somewhere else but you feel like you have more confidence in your ability to like meanderingly uh like dialogue with somebody else for the the 
entertainment of strangers? E, I mean, literally, my profession is a bit predicated on that. Great point. Um, and also, I will say, I don't know if I've ever said this before, but you have an excellent podcasting voice. And oh, one of my favorite things about doing this podcast is just like listening to you say things. Wow, that was super sweet, Alan. I mean it. Thank you. Yeah. I think you have a great voice. I don't. You know, I listen to it when I edit these sometimes. I listen to them and I'm like... I gotta take like a like a like a voiceover class or something because I'm sitting here and you know I got my like hi I'm Alan my no. voice is real nasally and when I get excited I'm like do I have no control over my modulation and then I listen to it and no, I'm like you got Fuck. you got a lot of timbre in the back of your throat it's because my neck up. and my whole neck is tense no I'm saying it's good I like it a lot I don't know it's got it's very uh, it cuts through the thick of of uh, like it, it grabs attention I'm okay yeah whatever. I think you're great, and you have pretty what's the, eyes. What's the phrase that there? That is true. That one yeah. I'll take because wow. it, it's true. Wow. wow, I didn't realize I was hitting such a like. I just I'm honest. I'm yeah. just honest. We are getting punchy. I'll uh, go to the end. Do it. Um, skip to the end. Skip to the end. Um, okay, uh, future heads. That was that band. Skip to the end. Anyway. Um, oh, I was quoting the show Spaced. Uh, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Edgar Wright, BBC oh, Television. Probably series. so was the future heads. The band with their song um uh check it out it's a great song uh, give it a five-star <laughs> review on itunes also check out uh spaced it's an excellent show it's super funny yeah. and uh give us a five-star review on itunes on space um alan every day uh every day when you meet somebody it's an encounter and it's just another roll of the dice damn that was the best one in a while yeah i thought of it early okay <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>